Okay, um, while I'm waiting to see if anybody is going to show up, have some questions here. Um, I thought I would um, go over a few things uh, in, case, in case anybody um, watches this uh, help session after the fact here. So we're starting on our week five for this uh, current uh, week and this current help session here. Um, um, so, you know, as a reminder, the the second problem set is due on Wednesday. So I think last week uh, I, I talked a little bit about the second problem set. So you can go back to last week's um, um, help video uh, if you're looking for some help on problem set two or you have some questions or as usual, feel free to email me questions during the week or come to help sessions um, if you want to ask them in person here. Um, and I did also get started with um, the programming assignment too. So, so I, I, I got you started on that. I might, um, this might be a relatively short video here unless some people show up and ask some questions. Uh, I might repeat some, some of both of those I think here is what I'm gonna um, start doing um, as I see if anybody wants to come by and ask some questions today. So, um, So I discussed problem set two in our last help session. Um, okay, got it on here. So, you know, the, the first question is about the, is using the uh, seven state transition diagram, which is the figure 3.9B from our textbook. So make sure you're using the right figure. And kind of as I gave a hint on this first problem, um, I mean, you really should list out all 42 possible transitions here. So if there's seven states, that means there's uh, seven times six equals 42 different possible transitions if you don't um, count or don't uh, include self transitions from the state back to itself, right? So really for this problem, um, if you want to be absolutely clear, you know, you should list out one, two, three, four, you know, all 42 of them, okay? Um, so yeah, we talked about that a little bit last time. Um, oh, and one thing, a big hint on problem two that might be useful for some people. Um, the, of course, you know, you can do it just by looking at the code here um, and answering the questions. Uh, but we do have the code for this this little threaded program. Um, so this this week five, uh, we're getting into. Um, the chapter um, on threads and threading here, the uh, chapter four of our textbook, right? Um, and so that's kind of why we have this question in there to start talk, start thinking a little bit about um, threading. And um, um, so our next topic, um, so our, our third kind of unit for this class, we get into what's known as concurrency issues um, and concurrent programming. So, um, um, so kind of understanding um, this, this threading question here this week uh, will help you get a start on that. So in particular, um, I, I, I did mention this last Wednesday, I'll mention it again. So, you know, if, if you go into our code editor, uh, Virtual Studio Code on our dev box here, uh, and if you look in the examples directory, I'm gonna close all this other stuff off, um, there's a um, set of examples for um, the assignment two, I'm uh, sorry, uh, examples here um, for, for problem set two down here. Um, in particular, the, the code that you are given in the written problem set um, is actually here and is actually compilable and runnable. So, you know, um, if you bring up this problem set zero two race.cpp, um, in Visual Studio Code, and you know, you do the usual um, Control Shift B to build. Uh, it should make it for you, hopefully. Um, in this case, though, you'll need to run it from uh, by hand, kind of from a terminal, because there's no unit tests on this. Uh, so it should compile to a to an executable called PS02, right? Uh, but then you can um, run it, you'll have to change to that directory or you can run it from a terminal inside of Visual Studio Code, right? Um, 
In this case, it's examples, problem set zero two. And if it built correctly, there's this PS02 for you, right? So um, as I showed last time, I mean, to help you kind of out, out with the question, you really probably should go look back at last Wednesday. I spent more time on that than I'm going to here, unless I get some questions about this question for the second problem set. Um, but, um, you know, you can, you can add code here. One thing I did suggest, um, um, so in the code as given to you, I think it, it slept for a whole second. So if you sleep for one second inside of the thread, both there and in the main, in the loop in main as well, oops, I keep doing that. So if we save it, rebuild it, um, you'll see, of course, it'll pause longer for each one of these. Um, and um, so one thing, one of the questions asked you about, um, you know, so if you have one second delay and you run this self, you run this by hand yourself, you'll probably see perfect interleaving. So it always runs. So the O output is coming from the um, from the main thread. So so this C out here with the O is, is what's outputting this O, and the dot output is coming from the um, the thread function, so the, the other thread that's running in this example. Uh, and, and with one second of, of delay or one second of sleep, it often perfectly uh, interleaves. But uh, one thing you should be aware of, um, I mean, you know, um, it doesn't ne it's not necessarily always gonna switch perfectly back and forth, you know, f running the function to running the main function and switching back, you know. So you won't always get the perfect interleaving. Um, and in fact, that was one thing I talked about. So if you make that delay, that sleep significantly smaller, like uh, one hundredth of a second, um, uh, you'll, you'll get much more varied uh, interleaving in there, right? So that, that's one thing you ought to think about. So why are you getting that interleaving? I mean, would you expect it to actually be um, perfectly interleaved or not? Um, and um, so here, I, I usually expect to see, um, eh, so that time it was, so it's still giving me pretty good, perfect interleaving there. Um, so you can see, uh, so there's a little bit of a skip there, right? So, so you might even have to make that um, sleep smaller than I thought. Probably it would depend on your system. Well, let's try thousands of a second here. Rebuild it. So um, anyway, you know, um, I, I did want to point that out because the in the written problem set it, it showed uh, an output that wasn't perfectly interleaved and, and you might be more likely to get it. So, so if you don't try it multiple times, you might not realize that it's not perfectly switching back and forth between the two functions. So, so I won't do that. And then of course, another big thing you should focus in on is, you know, why does this value end up being 21 here, right? I mean, what would you, what would you expect it to be? So notice we're outputting the, the result here at the end after both of the threads are done. Right, so this join causes the program to wait until both threads are completed, um, and then it can move on past that point. Um, but both of the threads are basically updating, incrementing that global, you know, so, so what would you kind of expect it to be, and, and um, um, what does the 21 mean that's happening? So that's kind of what I'm looking for um, in this question here. So. All right, so yeah, that was the that was the problem set. Like I said, I went into it a little bit more detail. I talked about this problem set question last time. So um, if you're watching this video after the fact, you know um, you might want to look at last Wednesday's help session for mo even more on the second problem set question. So, uh, but yeah, if, if if you're here, you know, feel free to ask. If, if, if you are working on the problem set, feel free to ask questions about either of those. So. 
Um, last week, I also got you guys started on the second um, programming assignment a little bit. So again, I might repeat a little bit of that. Uh, let me go ahead and open up the uh, process simulator here and a process simulator.cpp. So, so the header file and the um, implementation file for the process simulator. I probably still have the code in there that I did last time, I think. Yeah, so I can kind of show that. So, um, so yeah, hopefully, I mean, if you haven't started on the second program assignment, you know, um, I think that almost everybody really does need to, to start um, at least the week before, you know, so, so you've, you've still got um, a week and, and a day or two, you've got a week from Wednesday for the second program assignment, but, but most people do need at least a week worth the time. And it would be good to at least be thinking about that on this Monday on our three week um, cycles for the, the different sections here, right? So, I bring up the assignment description here. So um, in this second um, assignment, we're gonna be simulating a basic round robin scheduler. So, so we're not simulating a whole operating system, we're, we're simulating part of the scheduling um, function, okay? So, so we, we have to simulate um, a process and a process table, which I mostly give you in the process class and the process state class for this assignment. So, so besides the process simulator, there's a process state class that I'll, I'll look at, and there's also a process class, right? But I give you that class, um, which is a definition of the process that we need to use for our simulation. Um, and then basically what you have to implement um, in our second simulator is managing a set of processes that are running in the system and specifically managing them, managing them to go through um, the, the basic state transition between ready, running, and blocked for the most part. So those, those are the important ones, right? So to do that, you have to, um, you have to simulate a queue. You have to have a ready queue so that you can simulate round robin scheduling. Um, you have to have a, uh, some kind of a data structure that, that holds the whole, all the processes. So like uh, our, our textbook calls that the process control block, but it's, it's basically like a table or a list of all the processes in the system. And then you've got your ready queue and then you probably, you may need to have another list as well. Again, this depends on how you implement things, but you may need another list to hold the processes that are currently blocked in the block state, right? This one is, this assignment is a little bit more open-ended than the first one, so there, there's certainly a lot of different approaches that you could take to which data structures you use and um, um, how you implement, you know, um, checking things. Um, but, um, you know, for one thing though, you really do have to have a queue. And, and I thought I might talk, I might kind of mention the, the standard template library um, um, classes. So you really probably want to be using standard template library uh, queues or lists in this assignment. If you've never used the standard, the C++ standard template library, I mean, now is kind of a time to do that. I, I did have some videos on, probably it was on, had it under the previous week's content, week four, I think. Well, I might have copied them both to week four and week five. But if you've been looking at the uh, the the you know, materials I had, um, there's um, um, a, a video on kind of using the standard template library, which would be a good one to watch now, um, so that you can get some use, or, or the, the, so that you can maybe try using like a. Um, a a queue. Although I recommended, it, if if you watch the video, I recommend that you actually use a list um, because that will help. One of the things you have to do is you actually have to display the things that are on the ready queue, and you have to display the the processes 
that are um, currently blocked um, as part of the output. And um, you can't really iterate over a, a standard template library queue, but you can use a list just like a queue. So, so you can create a list, but then you can push things onto the um, end of the list and pop them off the front of the list to get the same sort of a queue dynamics where, where a queue is first in, first out, right? But then also when you need to implement the, the display portion where you're displaying all the processes that are currently um, ready and all the current processes that are blocked, um, you can iterate over the list, okay? So yeah, if, if you look at the output um, here, and, and um, maybe I should bring it up in our Visual Studio code, but um, um, before I jump too far ahead, so let's go back to kind of the basics of the simulation here. So the simulation, uh, you get an input file that looks like this for our simulation. So this just defines a sequence of events, okay? So new events cause a new process to be created um, and put into the ready queue in the system. So for the, the first simulation, um, there's one, two, just two news, so only two processes will be created um, and be running in, in the simulation here. CPU events uh, simulate a CPU cycle happening. So basically this is kind of where you have to keep track of, of doing the um, scheduling, doing the dispatching for the, the CPU, right? So if the CPU cycle is about to occur and no process is running, you need to dispatch a process. So you have to look at the ready queue um, and select a process, select the process that's at the front of the ready queue to become the running process, assuming that the ready queue isn't empty, right? Uh, likewise, if, if you've run some CPU cycles um, and your process exceeds the time slice quantum for the simulation, um, then you have to uh, time out the process. So in that case, you know, if, if the process has run its time slice quantums, um, it, it needs to be timed out and returned back to the end of the ready queue. Um, and then there's some other events in here for simulating um, I.O., so simulating a process blocking and unblocking, right? So if, if a block event happens, that means that whatever the current running process is, um, it's going to need to be transitioned into a blocked state. I mean, it needs to wait until um, an unblock event occurs of the same event type. So we just use a, an integer for the event ID. So anyway, in this case, whichever process got blocked, waiting for event 83 to occur, um, it would be unblocked when this occurs in the simulation and put back to the ready queue then. So put back at the end of the ready queue. So, um, and I guess the only other one we didn't mention was the done. So if, if, a, if a process is running when a done occurs, that means that the, the process should be, it should exit the system. So it should trans, transition to the, uh, to the done state. So. Um, so I think I stepped through this last time. So, so it, it's useful, you know, before we get into kind of the details of doing this second simulation um, to, to, again, to look at the, the, what we're simulating or how we're simulating things. So, so um, in that assignment description, I showed an example of the input, the events for the simulation. So, so this is our first um, simulation here right where we're just creating two new processes and they're running um, the the process event zero one dot result for q05 shows what the correct output should be um, if we're using a, a time slice quantum of five here okay so the the time slice quantum um, i described um, in the assignment description uh, that's how many time steps a process runs before it's timed out so so for round robin queuing you have what's known as a time slice quantum. Um, and, you know, a process could either block for I.O., that's one way that it can stop being the, the current running process. Or the other way is in order to implement round robin, um, we have some idea of how, what the maximum time that a process should run before um, it gets returned back to the ready queue and we let another process run um, um, for a bit, right? So that's known as the, the round robin time slicing quantum. Um, and part of running a simulation is you, one of the things you specify 
when you start the simulation is what the time slice quantum is, right? So if the time slice quantum is, is five, um, you know, what happens is for the, every CPU cycle is gonna output, um, um, one of these outputs here that we show. So, um, Actually, after every event, we, we output the current state of the system. Okay, so, app, um, so, so yeah, that's, that's what we're doing um, on the assignment that I gave to you for this semester here. So, uh, after every one of these events, we actually display the full current state of the system. So, let me describe this. So, after the new event, a new process should have been created. Okay, so currently the system time is one time slice quantum is five that we're using um, and we create a new process. So there's one active processes and no finished process. So this is information that your simulator has to keep track of, some of the things you have to implement. Um, and then what we show is a representation of the CPU and of the ready queue and of the blocked, the, the, the processes that are in a blocked state, okay? So after this point, when we created the first new process, the, there's nothing running yet, so the CPU is idle. There's nothing blocked, so there's no process in here, but there's one process that's currently on the ready queue, right? So whenever you create a new process, it's immediately put into the ready state and it's put onto the tail of the ready queue, right? So when you display, you, you have to implement this display here, um, when you implement that, you need to display your ready queue in your queue order. So, of course, there's no, you can't really see it when there's only one process here. Uh, but if you have multiple processes that are ready, you know, the, the one that's at the tail of the queue should end up at the bottom, um, and then it should go in order to the one that's currently at the head of the queue, and that should be the, the process that's listed at the top, okay? Um, the block list doesn't really have a, a, a um, an explicit order, right? So, I mean, you know, you're just blocked on a particular event. So, um, I don't really specify that, that you have to list the, the, the blocked processes in some specific order. So, you just have to make certain that all the processes that are currently blocked um, end up being shown on this blocked list if you have any. And, and, and even in this first simulation, you'll see an example of that. So. So after a CPU cycle, um, which is the, the second event that we'll show here, um, um, the system time increments by one. So basically we're simulating um, a discrete system clock that increments by one time step every time a CPU cycle happens. So, and, and this output is supposed to be the, the, the state of the system after the event. So this, this was the out, out, the state of the system after we ran our first CPU cycle. So the system time was, two now, system got incremented. Uh, and notice that, that the process got um, dispatched, right? So initially, the, when the new process was created, it was put on the ready queue. Now when we run the CPU cycle, we detected that the CPU was idle. So the, the dispatcher should have ran. So that caused this process to be taken off the head of the ready queue. So now the ready queue becomes empty. Um, and it was dispatched, so it became the current running process. So, so now we see that process one is running on the CPU, right? Um, notice, and, and since it ran one, you know, the, the system time ran one cycle, so now we're at system time two, um, and this process ran one time quantum. So the, the, the quant here is supposed to represent the number of time slice quantums in our current dispatch that we've run, right? And when this reaches, the, the, the system time slice quantum, then the process has to be timed out. So we can do the round robin here, right? So we've run one of our five so far after the first CPU cycle, right? And we have two more CPU cycles. So after the next CPU cycle, um, system time becomes three. So the only thing that happens, you know, the, the system time gets incremented and the, the, the time slice quantum and the total amount of time used get incremented for the process. So that was the, the second CPU cycle. And the third CPU cycle, we're up to our third time slice quantum um, so far, um, and system time is now four. Right. Now at this point, we're gonna have a new, another new process enter the system, right? So, so notice, um, you know, we, we don't run a CPU cycle, uh, we simulate a new process being handled and added to the system here. 
So, so after this new, we, we're still at system time four, um, but the, the new process has been created with the second process identifier has been put on the ready queue. But, but the process one is still the current running process on the CPU. Um, forgot to mention, since this is, we're simulating a single CPU system, you'll always only have either idle or one single process as the current running process should be displayed um, as the item uh, currently running on the CPU here. So, so um, now we're going to have uh, what, four more CPU cycles, but after the, the, the fifth one, so after two more CPU cycles, the process should time out. Right, so we can see that happening. So we have um, our fourth CPU cycle. Time system time becomes five, um, and we've used four time slice quantums after the fourth CPU cycle um, for process one. Right, and then after the fifth one, so we're basically down to um, here now. After our um, fifth CPU cycle, system time has gone up to six. We've, we've used, uh, so notice um, at the end of that cycle, we haven't run the dispatcher yet. Um, we've just run, um, but, but we have run the timeout function, okay? So at this point, process one timed out and got returned back to the tail of the ready queue. So, so it's, at, um, it, it's, it's at the tail, um, and then process two is now at the head of the queue, right? And, and that was the end of our fifth CPU cycle. Right, ready for system time six in, in the next cycle here. So at the start of the cycle is when um, the dispatcher gets called. So in this case, um, so, so our next CPU cycle, this one, um, the, the CPU is currently idle, so now the dispatcher will be called before we do the cycle, which, which causes process two to, to be dispatched. And then when we're done with the cycle, it will have, have run for one time slice quantum, right? Um, and our system time is seven, right? And it's gonna run another CPU cycle. So, so process two will keep running uh, for its second time slice quantum. And then here's our first example of, of blocking. Um, so, so IO being simulated, right? So at this point, process two is running and um, an IO event of type 83 occurs, right? So we need to block waiting on IO at 83. So after that, um, notice that we, we do the blocking and the, um, the, the dispatching. I'm um, oh, sorry, the, the blocking occurs, but we don't do the, you only do the dispatching at the start of the CPU cycle, but a block or a timeout happens um, either in response to a block or, or um, in response to timing out at the end of the CPU cycle here. Okay? So in response to that block, process two became blocked, right? But, but the system time didn't change, right? Because we didn't do a CPU cycle yet. Um, and then now on the next cycle, the, the CPU is going to be idle, so we're going to dispatch, and that will cause process one to start running again for a new time slice quantum, right? So now at the, at the next system time, process one is running again, um, um, and this was its first time slice quantum for the second time it was scheduled to run on the CPU, right? So, so it's used one quantum for this schedule, it's used a total of six um, CPU cycles so far. Five the for the first run it was scheduled and one now for this current uh, time slice quantum. Okay. Um, that's going to run another cycle, so it'll be to its second cycle here. So seven total cycles used, two in this time slice. Okay. Now the, the next one we're going to have an unblock, so this will just cause process two to go back to the ready queue. Right. So it's currently process two is blocked, um, so because of the unblock, it, it was waiting on an event of type 83. So since we received a, a, an event of type 83, uh, every process waiting on the event of that type should unblock when you get um, an event, an unblock event. So this causes process two to go back to the ready queue. Right? Um, and then process one is gonna run for, you know, it's third quantum. And then it's fourth quantum, and then this is an example of the done. So here, if you have a done, 
the, the running process, which is process one, means that it, it finished. So it, it should be put into an exit state or a finished state. Right? So it, the, the result of that is, is we don't display the processes that are, that are finished or exited. So you won't see process one anymore. You know, the, the time didn't change, but um, when you receive that done, process one exited, the, the CPU became idle because process one exited and we're ready for the next CPU cycle. So on the next CPU cycle, since the CPU is idle, uh, we'll end up dispatching process two to, to run another quantum. Right. All right, so that in a nutshell is kind of, 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 you know, you should make certain you understand kind of what's happening with the simulation. That's what, that's what we're doing here. So, um, so um, So last time I did get you started, um, I, I, I'll just show that again, although I won't completely repeat that. So your first task is to, um, uh, let me just go ahead and read uh, the first task here. So you have to start by um, getting these initial getter functions, like get next process ID, get num active processes to work, basically. Um, and you do that by um, implementing the uh, the constructor for the process simulator. Okay, so uh, so if we look at it at the tests, if I go up to the very first test here, um, actually uh, I mentioned this last time. The very first test case is actually testing the process class, not the process simulator. So um, all these tests should be passing uh, for you, um, assuming that nothing has happened. Uh, when you cloned and, and checked out the assignment two code here, right? So the first test that's gonna fail will actually be the second test case, um, uh, which is our first test of our process simulator here. And then the very first test is, is, is you know, when, the, when you create a new simula process simulator simulation, you pass in the, the time flash quantum, and that's the only, parameter that you give for these simulations, right? So here we're testing it using a time slice quantum of size five, right? So we expect um, if we carry a simulation with a time slice quantum of five, if we get the time slice quantum, it should tell us that it's five, right? Um, so um, again, you probably won't have to add, well, you will have to add a few things to the header file but not for this first task. So for this first task, there's already a constructor defined for you. And there's already like the get time slice quantum, the get next process ID. So all these getter methods are already defined for you, but they're all stubs, just returning like zero or something. So, um, so yeah, to get the first test, uh, and, and I sh again, I showed this last Wednesday. So to get like the first test or two to, to finish, let's just look at the first one. So for the first one, uh, you've got member variables like time slice quantum and the system time and the next process ID. So you need to initialize all those things. So, so you know, you should start to get that first test to, to work. You should initialize the time slice quantum to this initial time slice quantum that's given um, in the constructor there, right? And if you initialize that, uh, you also probably need to modify the uh, get time slice quantum. So the code I gave it to you probably just returns like zero or something for the time slice quantum. So, so, so you might have to fix that so it actually returns the member variable, the time slice quantum. So if you have those two things that it, it initializes the member variable and it returns it for the getter function, um, that will allow this first test to pass, right? And then likewise, the, the next task is, is, is initializing the um, next process ID, so, so this, member variable, you know, so, so again, the, this one, you know, it's not a parameter, the next process ID should, all, should start off as one. So all simulations use uh, one as the initial, uh, as the, the first process identifier for the first process that's created, right? So all you have to do is initialize next process ID to one um, and make certain that the getter of the next process ID returns the member variable next process ID. And if you do that, um, 
you should be able to pass the second test, all right? And then, you know, you should carry on doing the rest of those. So I kind of stopped there, I think on Wednesday, but um, you have to initialize um, the system time, right? So the system time should be um, initially um, whatever the tests say it should be, right? So we expect the system time to start off as, with a system time of one, right? So you want to initialize system time to one and then make certain it's get returned for the get system time. Um, and then now these I suggested in the video that, that uh, you might want to defer um, um, keeping track of these things. Well, you can kind of keep track of these. So, you know, the, there is a variable called um, um, number of finished processes. I mean, you could go ahead and add like a number of active processes um, as well, right? I didn't add that for you because you might want to, um, instead of having an explicit memory variable, um, if you're using like a list or something, um, you could just query the size of, of, of the list of your process table to get the number of active processes. But maybe to get started, it might be, if I didn't give it to you, you might want to also add like a, a get, like a number of active processes, right? And then initialize that to zero um, and then fix the, 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 the get number of active processes to return that member variable instead of returning zero, right? So if you're just returning zero, those, those things should um, actually pass those tests because you expect initially in the system um, that the number of active processes and the number of finished processes are zero, right? So, so, um, so you could leave those stubbed in. Um, I kind of suggested that you leave um, maybe those active and finished processes just stubbed in for the time bearing, but especially leave um, most of the rest of these stubbed in until you're ready to implement like your ready queue um, and then your blocked queue and then start adding those in, okay? But, but yeah, you might wanna get stubs so that you can get all these to pass. Um, um, and then that should allow you to get the first test case working, right? And then the second one then um, is where, um, where we're going to simulate a new process um, being created in the system. So at that point, you're probably going to have to, you know, uh, figure out how you're going to have your process control block represented and how you're going to have your ready queue represented um, so that you can then implement. So that once you add a new process, it gets put onto the ready queue, maybe also gets recorded in your list of processes or your process control block. Um, and then so that you can keep track of the information like, um, well, I mean, you know, you, you need to increment the next process ID for a new event, but um, um, you'd have to correctly say that I've got one process now currently in the system that hasn't exited yet, right? Um, okay. So yeah, like I said, that, that was kind of a repeat um, sum with, with a little bit of additional information, uh, but, but mostly a repeat of kind of what we did on Wednesday, right? Um, so um, I thought, it, and uh, I won't get into it um, real deeply here. I'll leave it for Wednesday or maybe next week. Although, you know, again, a week from today might be way too late to get started for a lot of people. Right. If you're just starting on Monday, when it's due on Wednesday next week, um, um, there will be a lot of things you need to figure out uh, in this assignment. So hopefully on Wednesday, uh, some people have some questions. We'll be working on the assignment. Um, we'll have some questions about, you know, how what's a good way to implement the, the process control block or my ready queue or things like that. So, um, So I'll just mention, you know, in that video about the standard template library, uh, again, I had some example code. Um, I believe that all those examples, let me see if I'm correct about that or not. Um, I don't remember if I put the examples for the standard template library. Um, I did not. So maybe I should go ahead and add those in there. So um, you could, um, 
take that code that, that I had uh, um, shown. I had I, hopefully I had some links at least to the the vector example and the QStack example, um, and you could add that into um, your project. Um, so, for example. Let me just download those. Um, so I'll copy that link for the vector example. And um, let's create a directory called um, STL for standard template library. Um, and then, oh, shoot, that link. I'm going to have to log in. Um, Yeah, I mean, you, you could, if you, if you log in there, you could download it um, either way. Um, I'm just going to download it actually uh, since I'm already logged in here um, actually if you click on that you'll get the, the, the whole code that was used in there I can probably just copy and paste that then that'd be quickest for me so this is vector example so let's um, let's create a new file in there called um, example.cpp and I should be able to paste the code in there yeah. save it um, admittedly yes so you'd also have to figure out how to be able to build this here um, yeah I should probably go ahead and add this um, so so you don't have to absolutely learn how to make a make file. I mean, we could compile this by hand. Um, I'll probably just um, say, use the make file that I had in this project as an example. So what I would probably do is, um, Um, make a new make file in here. And just make changes that we need to. Just don't want to save those. Um, so Like if I want to if I want to compile this vector example to CPP, um, we could um, say that's our source. Um, But yeah, to get to get this to work, we'd have to create like a new target here. So the the executable we want to build depends on um, an object file by this with the same name with the .o, and um, probably do it. Let's see if that actually works to build. So I'll get rid of everything else here. So with that as a as a build target, if we do our normal build, control shift B, we'll just try and do a make all um, and it should try and compile that. Um, uh, we had some errors so that might just be the code um, because 
uh, we're compiling with some strict flags here where we treat some types of what are normally warnings um, as errors. So, um, so yeah, it, so probably it would be better if I fix the code here. Um, so in the one case, we think I, well, we declared I as an integer, but, but we called the strings, uh, the, the size of a, a standard template library container, it returns one of these um, size types. So um, like for line 71, 78 here, I could just change these to size type, I believe. And maybe not, that's undefined. Um, probably have to um, add in um, that it's part of the standard library, although we're using namespace STD. Um, So just to make this happy, um, I might, I mean, the other thing, I can probably cast that to an int so that it says, you know, I, I know it's, it's not declared as an int type, but, um, but um, uh, treat it as an int because it really is basically an int. So. Yeah, that, that works for 78s. So I just have to, to fix all the other ones the same way, probably. So, uh, So yeah, maybe I'll add that ex this example to the uh, directory. But um, um, but yeah, if you got in the the code so you could run it, um, this will be useful um, because you might want to use maybe not a vector, but you might want to use uh, like the lists or things that we showed examples of in the other example. But that it should allow me to um, actually run those code examples. So. So yeah, it's, all those things are running now. So, um, so the other one, kind of the last thing, I should, I should have um, just copied the other example in there to begin with. So, so vectors, you know, maybe, but uh, but yeah, all the stuff with the Q stack examples would be more relevant. So. If we had that uh, in here, I'll just call it qstack.cpp. So, I mean, there are examples of using a list um, and treating the list. Um, as a stack or treating the list as a queue. So specifically, of course, if you, if you use a list of processes uh, and treat it as a queue, so you uh, push to the back and then pop from the front, that would allow you to um, create a, um, um, your ready queue, basically. And you can maybe use another list um, for your um, blocked items, right? Um, You might want to consider the, the vector. I mean, you could just use a regular, um, just a plain array of processes for your um, process control block, your, your main list of processes that you're managing in the simulation, right? <coughs> but um, um, use, using a static array has some drawbacks. So for one, you'd have to define like a maximum size. 
So, so you might end up limiting yourself to only being able to have, you know, if you say, if you say your process control block is size 100, you can only simulate up to 100 processes. Um, if you use a vector, um, it can dynamically shrink and grow by like pushing things on the back, but then you can use, um, um, I believe it's the vector, you, you can use um, the array, um, So yeah, I mean, for a vector, you know, you can maybe push new processes as you create them, but you can treat it like a regular array, C, C array. So you can use an index like the process identifier. Although you have to be careful because uh, we start with a process ID of one, um, and uh, the, the first item that you push or that you get onto your vector is gonna be at index zero. So you'd either have to go around making certain that you subtract one from your process ID, so process ID maps to index zero, or you could push a dummy process zero on there so that you can always use the same process ID as the index uh, into your vector or into your you know, static um, array, if, if you just want to use a, a static array, so. Right. But, but that can be useful. So the, the, the main reason why that might be useful is that you can dynamic, you can treat it dynamically, right? So you can just, whenever you need a new process, you create it and you can push it um, to the back. So it'll end up as the next, um, you know, if you're pushing them in order that you create them, you would expect the first process to be at index zero or where you could push a dummy process and have your first process at index one. And then the next process would be after that and so on, right? Um, all right, so that's some hints. Maybe, um, um, like I said, um, on Wednesday, I might, uh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and put this, this STL examples um, into our repository so that people can use those. And I might talk some more about some approaches to using STL containers for uh, implementing your queue um, and your process control block and your, your list of block processes and that kind of stuff. So, all right. So yeah, I think that's it for today. I'll go ahead and stop the video. Um, as usual, if, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or come by on Wednesday um, and, and ask in person if you've started working on the assignment. Uh, yeah, and I'll see everybody on Wednesday then.